Here we are in the County Clare. We're here in Craig and Owen. Today we're going to be watching Jack Pinson as he turns a spalted piece of beach into one of these majestic little bowls. Enjoy. So, split, splitting time with the fro. This is to make a bowl blank to turn in the bowling. Beach from the woods here. Get it scored first. So there's a, a deepish scoreline across the top where I wanted to split. Oh, it's gone quite nicely. Sweet. Uh, I'll come back to that a bit later. This is a bit for now. The throw, throw work went pro quite well that time. I'm quite pleased with that. This will be quite a shallow bowl or plate. Uh, the next task is to face up, flatten this face here in line with my split mark. You can see the way the grain swept it out in a bit of an angle. So I'm going to take that off with the axe, which is my grand, trusty Gransford side axe, right-handed. And that next stage here, take off some corners on the back of the log. Created a bit of a triangle shape there. Let's see. So then taking off a new section. That's this beak that's developed there. That's going to come off next. On the other side as well. We can kind of check what's the surface area there and there. There's a bit more on this side. It's a bit uneven on that side, so then you can kind of trim it up a bit as a guide. That's what I've been doing anyway. I'm going to use my compass to scribe out a circle of where the, the rim of the bowl will be uh, approximately. There's my centre. Just gives me a rough guide to use to shape to get a rough overall axed circular disc. But that gives me a guideline to rough it out now with the axe. Yeah, so it's always harder to cut across the end grain with an axe, so that's why I've shaped these sides down to be a bit thinner first. That's an uh, overall rough rounding, good enough to go into the lathe. A couple more steps on shaping the blank first. I've got to make a flat base, flattish base, to accept the centre from the lathe. That'll do for roughing out with the axe. 
it's hard work, it's hard on the joints. The least, the less amount of that you can do, the better. That's why the lathe is important. It takes all of that material out in a matter of whatever time it takes, less than an hour for the, for the internal shaping, compared to doing it maybe with an adze or a chisel or a gouge or a hot coal, much more labor intensive and let much less even results. Hence the invention of the pole lathe. My next job will be to put in a mandrel into the center of there. I'm gonna mark the center a bit more deeply from where the compass was. And then just in that center point, make a nice extra flat uh, cut to allow the mandrel to fit comfortably against the surface. So this next stage now is driving the mandrel, which is this piece, it's a pre-prepared cylinder with a center hole in, this, in the butt end of it, and then some spikes driven or screwed into the other end. Those spikes, I have a center one to locate the mandrel onto the workpiece, and then three other ones around it just to hold everything in place. So I have the, the pins slightly flattened, that I just filed them. Uh, it means that hopefully the blank won't split as I drive the man mandrel into it. Um, I just have to orientate them correctly in the grain, that's all, yeah. So that's that way. That's the centre mark there. Tap it in, get it started. And then I'll just start driving it, but I'll spin it round, keeping an eye on where the pins are going into the surface of the timber. And if a split starts to develop, I'll probably take it out and then pre-drill pre the holes a small bit. But it's okay so far. Yep. And they can hear the difference in the sound then when, when the mallet's engaging. And then it's already driven all the way in. So that's driven in. So the mandrel is now attached to the workpiece in one, in one section. Now it's time to move it over onto the lathe and center the other end of the bone blank, uh, first without the rope on it, and then I'll put the rope on and we'll start turning it. That's the plan. We're over on the pole lathe now. Uh, I have the mandrel driven into the blank, as you saw previously. It kind of looks a bit like a mushroom, just for fun. But what I need to do now is find where the center of the back of the bowl is in correlation with the center on the mandrel. Center on the mandrel goes into the po poppet on my left side, like that, and then I can tap the other poppet which is now loose in the lathe bed until it starts to engage. I'm holding it roughly where I think the centre will be as, at a guess and then I start to turn it and then that tells me actually there's a low spot and a high spot on the mandrel and that's the high spot there approximately. So I'm going to take out the workpiece and recenter it in there and hope it's a bit better. It's not totally there yet. Getting better, you could probably go with that. If I go much, if I do much more adjustment, there'll be just loads of holes on the base. Yeah, okay, that's pretty good. So now the mandrel, never mind the workpiece, that's going all over the place. It's not uh, cylindrical at all. But I'm just looking at the mandrel to see that it's spinning fairly flush and flat. I'll make, a, make that hole a bit more obvious using my non-historical threaded bar to make the hole where it's found a nice center more obvious. Yeah, and then I can tap out the wedge at the bottom, move the poppet, wrap the rope around the mandrel towards me like that, back into the centers again. Centers being these parts on the poppets, the metal parts. So that's the both poppets, these parts here, locked down to the lathe bed with the workpiece attached to the mandrel spinning between the centres. We'll see if it spins now. Or how it spins. There we go, that's spinning. As it starts to spin, the centres make a little bit more indentation in the, in the bowl and in the mandrel. I can, I can adjust that by Tapping the poppet further in with the wedge loose, or I can use a threaded bar. 
I take my tool rest, which has various positions on the back here, set it in place where I think it'll work, and then I can use my hook gouge or hook tool to start shaping the back of the bowl. It's too far away. I don't really know what I'm doing until I do it, you know. So there's quite a lot of asymmetry in this at the moment. And the first task is really just to knock off the high spots in that asymmetric shape. Because I'm only so accurate with an axe. It's always harder when you come out towards the rim. It's further from the centre, it's kind of spinning faster and it's cutting across end grain more obliquely. So, for this process I'm using a combination of two similar yet distinct hook gouges. These are made out of uh, modern material, these are coil spring straightened out and then flattened on the end and then beveled and then edged. And I keep a nice sharp edge on them. It doesn't need to be razor sharp, it's better if it is, but it's better, you, you can get away with a abrasively sharp edge on these for most timber. It's very easy to get carried away with this finishing try and get it really perfect. Okay, so now I have the outside of the bowl shaped fairly well close to how I'm happy with for now. There's n almost no more extra flat spots. There's one there, but I shall be dealing with that now with the next stage, which is making the foot on the bowl. Went a bit tighter there. So this part will be shaved off down by hand at the end. I have to leave it till the very end, until after it's out of the lathe. And I try to get a convex shape on the underside of the bowl. So as it dries out and warps a little bit, you won't have a bowl that rocks too much on the table. Go a bit more, there's a still a flat spot from the ax there, so I might Come in a little bit more here. Happening there, that means the centers are getting a bit dry. So I have a little bit of handy oil just to put on. Just to stop that, you might even hear the difference now. How much smoother that is. Yeah. Quite pronounced actually. I always forget to do it, and then I always remember it was worth doing. I like it like that, so we'll call that good on the back of the bowl, and we'll, we'll flip it around and start hollowing. Knock it out the wedge, move back the poppet, turn the whole thing around, wrap it back up in the rope, 
into the center again. Lock down the poppet and then just check it's spinning nicely. I end up having to swap the position of the rope here. Every pole and every pedal is different, but this is the way I want to work this one. And then also readjust the tool rest and spot. And now I can start hollowing out the center with the other tool I'm going to start with. Just give it a nice base on here first. to make sure there's not any major tear out points and that the pith from the center of the log is definitely gone which it isn't really i have to, I have to take down the rim a little bit further to get rid of that pith on one side the pith is where the, the bowl would split from if it was left in the bowl start now to see the beginning of what will become the core in the bowl. Hmm. So from now on it's hollowing and then right at the very end there'll be another process of tapering down the core after having done a finishing fine pass with the tool. But the, the majority of the next phase now is to take out all of this central material. And that doesn't really matter, you just got to get it out. But actually, well, that's good for a time lapse. So, I'm got, I've got to a stage on the hollowing out of this bowl where I'm into the finishing stages and I'm using the bevel up tool to do a final finishing pass, uh, I'm hoping, on the inside of the bowl. Uh, what wood is that? This is made out of beech wood and it's heavily spalded. <coughs> and I'm just, I feel inside it for ridges. And when I find a bit of a ridge or a thicker section, I can bring the tool into that point and start to shave it down. So I get a nice even wall thickness at all points, except for I want a bit more mass at the rim where it's a bit thicker, so it needs to be slightly stronger than that. Uh, yeah, the base is still quite thick, I'm going to do a bit more in the centre there. turn the core down narrower, tapered into the base of the bowl. I, it exposes more of the bottom of the bowl, but I can then finish up with the tool as well, so I get a nice turned even bottom base of the bowl. Of course, not all the way to the centre, because we need to leave something that's still attached. So there's another choice coming off the core narrowing down as I go. Gotta be careful not to catch the rim of the bowl with the shank of the tool as well at this angle. So 
that's close to the bottom there, so I'm going to come and rotate the tool around, get it flush with the bottom of the bowl, and bring it in with a, a slicing cut, trying to avoid any high spots or a ridge developing in the sen in the, up to the centre of the bowl. The bowl base, I guess. Also, I've got to be careful not to go too thin and bust burst my way through the bottom of the bowl. So my hand can feel what my eye can't see sometimes inside these forms. So that's why I'm using like a marking gauge or a, or a set of calipers. You've also got to be careful not to hit the pins inside the core that come from the mandrel. And also not go too deep, too narrow at the base of the core that it won't snap out easily. So how long does it take you to make a bowl? Um, I've done, a, I've done a, a smaller one of these, the quickest I've done from the, from the cutting off the log with the handsaw, splitting it, shaping the blank with the axe into the lathe, turning the back and the front, oh, oh, and the hollow, uh, 55 minutes. Which is quite slow compared to an electric oh, yeah. lathe, where you might have a bandsaw to make your blank with. Yes. But that was all done with either axe or these tools here. Yeah. No, no sanding finish. <laughs> And that's going to do it. I reckon. Is that going to hold the candle? No, no. Uh -huh. You'll see in the next stage now that'll snap it out. I think we need to get you doing this now. Okay. So I've been given the honour of uh, removing the core of Jack's bowl here. So I'm going to grab it like this and uh, pray. Well done. There we go. <laughs> right, so the core is snapped out. It's been fully turned on the lathe. It won't go back in the lathe now. That's it. Um, there's a stub left inside where the core used to be and a foot on the on the bottom of the bowl So just the, uh, the last thing is just to clean them up really so that's what I'm going to do now There's all sorts of ways. I'm sure of doing it. This is the way I've been doing it and It's been working so far So I'm going to carry on with that. I do it on my lap I'm holding the tool close in and my hand is against the bottom of the workpiece Regulating how far that tool can slip So not far is the answer One side, I'm going across the grain with it here. You could carve this all out with a hook knife or even a flat knife on the back as well. There's a bit. That's the majority of it gone. I could keep refining that until it's totally smooth, but that's uh, lower than the surface of the the, uh, the bottom rim, the foot, the sort of the foot rim there. So it'll be okay. Might do a bit more later. And then I use my hook knife, which is this one here, to carve out the stub that's left in the bottom from the core snapping. So that's uh, I need to get in a nice position. Mm -hmm. This is where you keep your hand away. danger which I just did a little bit there is you come too far and catch the inside of the bowl with the with the knife which leaves a scar or a little cut, cut mark so that's why I have it pressed against my my hands pressed together close and making a small cut and that's a bowl
And no sandpaper or anything like that. No, nope, that's to finish <laughs> off the tools. You can, yep. you can feel that now. Yep. Right, that's just tidying up at the end, really. I could do a bit more, or I could just settle for as it is. The next thing I can do on this is oil, put oil onto it. So the purpose is really to slow down the drying process. Because what I've done is exposed a whole load of new timber, which was inside the log, like wicking moisture out really slowly. But now it's on the surface, it can just lose moisture really quickly, especially through the cut sliced off end grain. The, end, the grain is running that way and the tool has cut it off at angles, in particular here, right across at 90 degrees to the tubes of fibres and bundles of fibres which have moisture and sugars and saps inside them. So I'm gonna pour a bit of oil inside. Oh, that's probably too much. I've got, in this case, grapeseed oil, just from a supermarket. You can use it in your salads, so you can use it on your bowls. And then, if you watch the colour change as the oil goes into it, it really brings out the colour nicely. Look at that now. A little bit little more to do right there. But it's sucking up the oil a lot. So this can be redone, maybe even every day if you get round to it, for a while. What's a while? Until it stops sucking up more oil. When it gets saturated, you know that's good. Um, yeah, so that's oiled on the inside. On the outside there's a damp patch here from where there's a lot more sap and there's, a, there's some drying patches there for example, pale white patch. Uh, so I'm going to even them all out and I'm going to pour a bit of oil on the back. Luckily I put a nice foot there so it won't all run off. I wasn't lucky, it was deliberate and then cover over all those areas and actually I might even need more of this taking up taking a lot of oil that's good just a little bit of rag or kitchen roll and you can do this to maintain your wooden bowls at home as well so we've got you can you'll be able to see the color change on this now as I put oil over it And the nice thing with the grapeseed oil, it doesn't seem to discolour, it's kind of clear as it goes on and stays clear. Linseed oil I find does yellow the surface quite a lot. Um, other oils that I have used successfully be walnut oil, but of course you've got to be careful with people with nut allergies if you're doing, if you're selling them to people. Um, but it does, it gives a nice finish and it doesn't, and there's, yeah, very low odour and very low impact other than allergies. Um, there we go, oiled. And actually, because it's quite char characterful and spalded already, it's some of the timber was almost like like dead and dry basically already. So that means it will dry out much quicker, and it means you can use your bowl. This this particular bowl can be used a lot more quickly than some of the fresher bowls that are just made out of um, a brand new piece that has none of that character, like one of those. Um, yeah, just different timber has different amounts of dampness in it. All right, so cornflakes time, I think. So there we go, lads. That was Jack Pinson turning a spotted beach bowl on a pole. I hope that was as satisfying to watch on camera as it was in person. If you want to see any more of Jack's stuff, he exists on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok as Living Longbows. Well worth checking out. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you in the next one. Good luck.